deconstructing the past to help you make sense of today. Time for another award-winning episode of Pre-Nicene Perspective with your host, Darren Kalama. Almost 2,000 years ago, St. Marcion of Sinope and Pope Pius I stood inside of a marble foyer in Rome and hurled invectives at each other, each castigating the other with charges of being a wild-eyed heretic. The year was 144 AD, and the seeds of a fight that was planted at the Council of Jerusalem in 48 AD was now in full bloom as the latter champions of the apostles Paul and Peter squared off once again. This time, though, with Marcion raising the banner of Paul in his rejection of the Judaizers and Pius, like Peter, refusing to part ways with the alien religion of the Judeans and their murderous desert war god Yahweh. Marcion was the son of the Bishop of Pontus, a fervent believer in Christ and the owner of a large fleet of ships, and he had just finished retracing the steps of the Apostle Paul and revisiting all of the churches he established throughout the Roman Empire, collecting all of his original letters, you know them today as Paul's epistles. He also acquired the Gospel of the Lord, Paul's revelation received directly from Christ on the road to Damascus in 34 AD. Marcion transcribed these letters and gospel in their original Greek and put them in codex or book form for the first time, creating the very first Christian Bible. And also for the first time, he laid out side by side our Christian Bible with the Jewish Torah. And what he saw shocked him and Everyone else who saw it with him shocked them to the core. Simply put, there was no way this barbaric Hebrew Torah deity Yahweh or Jehovah with his commands to murder women and babies multiple times over multiple centuries could possibly be the same God revealed to us all by Jesus Christ. It was plain as day and right there in black and white. Now, with this new information, Marcion immediately ordered his fleet to Rome. Pope Pius must be made aware of this. These, these letters from Paul and his gospel of the Lord would save Christianity from the Judaizers and their demonic sleight of hand. After all, here was the proof of it all. Perhaps Marcion even had visions of the Pope calling him a hero and venerating his courageous adventures as he sailed along the western coast of Italy, his excitement over the meeting no doubt growing. And boy was he in for a surprise, as the stage was set for a showdown in which Marcion had a Bible and Pius didn't. You see, Pius and the Judeo-Christians only had the Torah scribblings to rely on for written doctrine and dogma, and the name Jesus Christ wasn't found in any of them. In fact, Pius and the Judeo-Christians wouldn't have their own Bible until hundreds of years later when the Catholic Church finally cobbled one together in 382 AD. And of course, they stapled the Torah to the front of it and renamed it to the Old Testament after some semantic bleaching and a translation process that ultimately went from Hebrew to Greek to Latin to English. More on that later. You see, embedded in this conflict between Marcion and Pius is the same conflict we have now, 2,000 years later. The church Marcion founded still exists today, and so too does that first Bible. And recently there's been something of a rebirth, a rekindling, if you will, as people watch what can only be described as a satanic wave envelops and hijacks Western governments and subverts Judeo-Christian churches and denominations in a high tide of demonic filth and apostasy, just as it's described in 1 Thessalonians 2.15. But not all is lost. In fact, far from it. Bishop Andrew Theophilus of the Marcionite Christian Church says it sparked a spiritual survival instinct to kick in among some people, people who perhaps years or even decades ago struggled with the gnawing feeling that something just wasn't right about this Bible with its two different religions stapled together, the God of each representing polar opposites of the spectrum of good and evil, one demanding his worshippers commit genocide and 
murder women and even little babies still in the womb on multiple occasions. Basically the theological equivalent of Charles Manson with a real estate license. While, on the other hand, the other God loved all of humanity equally, so much so, he sent his only son for our salvation. So you see, making these two the same was like trying to fit a square peg in a round hole, mixing oil and water, or spray painting graffiti on the Mona Lisa. For billions of Christians, it was simply a bridge too far. They felt isolated, asking themselves, am I the only one that sees there are two completely different, incompatible, and diametrically opposed religions and gods at play here? And any discussion they had with priests or pastors on the subject yielded vague, non-responsive, or ethereal answers at best, a thin gruel indeed. And it is at this point where many billions have simply walked away from Christianity after having been left with a false choice between the Yahweh poison pill contained within an alien carnal religion and atheism. I'm going to read to you now a letter from a Mr. M.K. in Greece, and I think it puts things into a present-day perspective, and you may notice you've had thoughts similar to the ones expressed here. Quote, Dear Mr. Kalama, for my entire life I was unable to reconcile in my mind the contradictions of the Christian churches, the OT and NT, so in my teens I decided it was going to be easier to be an atheist than a believer. From the time I was a kid it was clear to me that Yahweh was a demon and that Christ simply ascended and descended to earth. He's a god after all, it's easy to do. Why would he go through the trouble of faking a birth, hanging around for 30 years, and then finally start his mission? But this contrarian stuff was science fiction, so it was better to shut up and be an atheist. At the age of 55, I tried to reconnect with the church, but once again found myself struggling with the contradictions. Then I stumbled upon your pre nicene Perspective podcast. Behold, I'm not alone. But the local churches are completely closed to any of these ideas. It's blasphemous. Unquote. So you see, you're far from being alone. And I chose this letter not because there was anything unique about it, but rather because it captures and encapsulates the essence of thousands of other letters and emails we've received at pre nicene Perspective. And more importantly, it's the exact same kind of correspondence received by the bagful at the Marcionite Christian Church. Do you realize, though, how many people actually make the effort to take another look at Christianity like MK did here in this letter after walking away from it at a young age? Over the last 2,000 years, we've lost billions of Christians to atheism or weird religious cults. And it is this, I can tell you truly, that is the devil's greatest trick. The fact that people have to spend their entire lives to even become aware that the first Christian Bible even exists should tell you a lot about the efforts made over the millennia to suppress it, including, but not limited to, a Domnatio Memoriae from the Roman emperors that came within inches of erasing it entirely from history. At the end of the day, it's very simple. You signed up for Jesus, but they sold you a Yahweh. Ask any candidate for the seminary why he's there. Well, he was driven by a calling to Jesus, and their instructors will subvert and replace that calling by spending years indoctrinating him into the Yahweh cult and convincing this soon-to-be priest that 2 plus 2 does indeed equal 5. But it doesn't have to be that way. And for millions of the pre nicene Christians before you, it wasn't. If they were somehow teleported to our era today, they would take one glance at the Judeo-Christian Bible with its alien Torah stapled to the front, pause, look at the decayed apostate Judeo-Christian megachurches preaching about some figment of their imagination called Yeshua, and ask you, why you are worshiping the same barbaric deity as the people who killed Christ. Why? And their next move would probably be to buy airtime and organize a worldwide exorcism on live TV. And Lord knows we need it. And by the way, as an important aside, 
You won't find the name Yeshua in any Christian Bible, nor will you find the name Jesus Christ in any Torah Old Testament. Remember, in 144 AD, Pope Pius had the opportunity to compare our Christian God as revealed in the first Christian Bible with the murderous Torah deity side by side, in black and white with St. Marcion himself standing right there with him. But Pius, like Peter before him at the Council of Jerusalem in 48 AD, was afflicted, was blinded by the veil of the Old Testament Torah, covering his eyes and mind. I think 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 9 through 13 says it better than I ever could. Quote, Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished, but their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Unquote. Of course, in the end, Peter was crucified upside down, and Pius obviously chose poorly. Marcion himself would walk away from that meeting and establish new churches across the entire expanse of the Roman Empire based on that first Bible, and it would grow even larger than the Roman Catholic Church at one point. Knowing what we know today, ask yourself, who was the real heretic? And also know you're not alone. You can reconnect with that first Bible in the Marcionite Christian Church at marcionitechurch.org and theveryfirstbible.org. Reconnect with the golden years of Christianity when we had our own Bible, our own faith, and our own God as revealed to us only through Jesus Christ. Stop renting a room in someone else's religion and stop internalizing the commands of your oppressor. Our Father expects better of you. In closing, M.K.'s letter also asked about attending Mass, and I would be remiss if I didn't address it here in the episode as well. If a Marcionite meeting house isn't in your area, the reconstructed pre-Nicene Mass is broadcast daily on the pre-Nicene Christian Radio Network, and that happens at 8 a.m. EST every day, every morning. You can find a PCRN at pre-Nicene.org. May our Father's Holy Spirit find and guide you, even as the enemy of all mankind persecutes us. I'm Darren Kalama, and we'll see you next time on Pre-Nicene Perspective. Kill them all, old and young, girls and women, and little children. Does that sound like something Jesus would ever say to you? The first Christians didn't think so either. And that's why you won't find the Old Testament in the first Christian Bible of 144 AD. Reconnect with your pre-Nicene Christian roots and the Bible you were meant to have. Ten books and the Gospel of the Lord. Download your free ebook at theveryfirstbible.org.